Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Wallace. I am the uh, circulation supervisor at the Ridgewood Public Library, and I'm also the outreach librarian. Um, on behalf of the Ridgewood Public Library, our director, Nancy Green, the Board of Trustees, we are delighted to have Don Torino join us for a wonderful talk on how to create a backyard wildlife garden <laughs> to attract birds, butterflies, all different sites. Uh, types of wildlife. Um, I, I just started bird watching a year ago and I went to one of Don's classes on beginning birding and um, just within a year from meeting Don, I, he is so informative and helpful and encouraging that uh, some people think I've become a birding expert in just a year. So he has a lot to offer and to teach and I'm just so excited to have him join us today. Um, as I mentioned before, this program will be recorded. Uh, if, so if you're having any technical difficulties, uh, we will be sharing it at the end of the program. And we're also going to be sending out a survey and feedback form at the end. So if there's other virtual programs or topics that you would like the library to discuss, um, we invite you to let us know what you would like to see us do. Um, so uh, without further ado, because nobody wants to hear me, here's Don. <laughs> thank, thank you, Karen. Uh, and a big thank you to the uh, Richmond Library and Nancy Green for um, the invitation. Um, and so, I, you know, this is, this is one of my favorite programs to do. Uh, because it's really an empowering program. You know, so many things in the environmental world, especially Bergen County Audubon and other conservation groups that are involved in, you know, it's a lot of tough work, right? Writing letters, lobbying elected officials, sometimes even protests. But this is one of those things that we could do today, like right now, and, and create a better environment to help everything from birds, butterflies, and pollinators, and, and even ourselves. So this is, this is just a, a great idea. And look, we, we are probably paying more attention to our backyards now more than ever, and for good reason. But, you know, here in, in, in New Jersey, we're going to reach something called build out eventually. It may be the first state to do that, where everything is built on is built on and everything that's preserved is preserved. The only thing left is our backyards, right? Our backyards and schoolyards and churchyards. That's the only habitat that's gonna be left. Well, we can't, you know, stop buying houses and knocking them down in factories and probably wouldn't wanna do that. But we can change the way we garden and we can improve those, uh, uh, make those habitats in our backyard to help wildlife, right? We live in an amazing area. Now, you know, it may not seem like it, but New Jersey is one of the best plays for birds in the whole country. We're probably number five or six as far as the number of bird species that we could see, right? So you can go to Alaska and go all these other states. We could see more birds right here in, in New Jersey. On the Atlantic Flyway, which is the Route 46, the Garden State Parkway, the Route 80 of migratory birds, this is the place that you wanna be. That's why we have the World Series of Birding here, because think of all the uh, amazing habitats that we have here. If you go from one end of the state to Cape May, the High Point, and right here in our area, we have the Meadowlands, we have the New Jersey Highlands, we have all the great local nature centers, we have the Hudson River, we have all, and all those different habitats Along the Atlantic Flyway mean many, many bird species. So we're very lucky in that regard. But you know, there is, there is bad news out there for birds. You know, they're in trouble. Uh, the last report you probably saw last year that we've lost 3 billion birds since 1970. And we shouldn't be surprised by that in, in reality because of the habitat that we lost. And also at the, about the same time, the study came out from National Audubon that because of climate change, we could put 389 bird species on the brink of extinction. But again, this is something that we could do something about ourselves. Yeah, we have to fight to save habitat and we have to fight to do something about climate change, but you could do something about that immediately. And you know what the best way, the quickest way to relieve bird stresses from climate change is to create a wildlife garden, is to plant native plants in your own backyard. So we're on that Atlantic Flyway, and right now migration is inside. Migration is amazing. So 
these tiny little neotropical birds that are in South America and Central America that weigh less than an ounce, some of them, are coming right to your back, through your backyard. And they fly all night, little birds fly all night long, and they come to your backyard exhausted, right? Tired, exhausted. Well, unless you have the proper food for them and a proper habitat for them, they may not make it. If you ever walk out in your yard early in the morning this time of year and just see a bird lying there dead, but chances are it didn't have enough energy to make it any further. But we can create those, those stepping stones, those, those islands between our nature centers and, and forests and parks. So you think about it, around Bergen County, you have the celery farm, right? You have uh, Tenafly Nature Center, Teaneck Creek, the Meadowlands, all these great places. But what's in between that? In between that is buildings and concrete, but there's also us. So we can create those stepping stones between those nature centers to help our birds on that migration route. And make no mistake, there's, there's many backyard birds that aren't migratory. Our cardinals, chickadees, nut hatches stay all year long, but we could be helping those too. And, and so my challenge really to you is gonna be to Think differently today when you when the program is over and you look out in your backyard. I want you to think of your backyard as a habitat because that's what it really is. You know, we kind of do things to our backyard that we would never dream of doing to a local nature center, right? So we might use pesticides, insecticides, but if you got a letter in the mail saying that uh, we're putting you on notice that the celery farm is gonna be loaded with pesticides and insecticides. Now you would be out there, you'd be calling everybody and be out there with protest signs. Well, you can't do that stuff to your backyard because it's just as important. Everything is connected. Now we started this uh, program uh, years back and we always knew how, how important backyard was, was and, and, but what really started us going years ago is that uh, some of our volunteers uh, tag monarch butterflies. And people ask, how do you tag a monarch butterfly? Very carefully. Uh, but so as one of our volunteers was tagging monarch butterflies in, in Palisades Park, uh, about two weeks later, or 10 days later, some of those butterflies, three of those butterflies that got tagged wound up in our education director's backyard in Hackensack. Think about it. You know, we knew that that was the same butterflies because we could read the tag numbers. So we said, well, that's amazing. You know, and so what happened in between? You know, what if, what if that yard wasn't there that was full of the correct native plants that helped those butterflies? Where would they have gone? Did the rest not make it because they couldn't find the proper habitat? And that's when we knew that we really had to really go public and ask people to really work on their backyards and create uh, uh, wildlife gardens in their own backyard. So how do you do that, right? Um, well, it's, it's easier than you think. And, and, you know, any habitat is the same thing that we need, right? Food, water, shelter, places to raise young. And that could be very different depending on what species we're trying to help. But the basis of all that, the foundation of a good, healthy habitat is native plants. And there's many scientists who think now that the only way we'll be able to save migratory birds is to change the way we garden. That's how important it is. Um, so for example, you could have an oak tree, a white oak, that may attract 417, no, probably 517 species of Lepidoptera. It means moths and butterflies are going to eat that, the leaves on that plant and create little caterpillars, in turn creating food for migratory birds. And a little chickadee will eat hundreds and hundreds of caterpillars a day, believe it or not, a day. So multiply that by all the other birds. So a bird can come into your backyard and it's, it's full of non-native plants. For, for uh, example, something like a, uh, a Bradford pear uh, might attract one species of Lepidopter or none. So you could have this lush, green, beautiful backyard, which looks beautiful to the eye, but to a migratory bird, it's a wasteland. It would be like you going into ShopRite and walking around and you go to, go to the produce aisle and everything winds up to be plastic. 
that's how that's how much of a, a kind of a desert is created by using non-native and invasive plants in the backyard. So our, our native plants are just as beautiful and to me even more beautiful because they have a function. And so but we, when we change the way we do that, and, and it doesn't, you know, I don't want you to think of a wildlife garden as being wild. It doesn't have to look like a jungle. It can be as beautiful as any other garden. Just using native plants are, are uh, again, the foundation of a true healthy habitat. We'll get into some more plants. Providing water uh, is important. And that could be as simple as a top of a garbage can to a bird bath, shallow source of water for the birds. Birds don't like to bathe any deeper than knee deep. So if you can imagine knee deep on a chickadee, it's about five feet long, knee deep on a chickadee. So a shallow bird bath with lots of stones in it, uh, create and change the water, change the water frequently. You know, you don't have, you don't want mosquitoes to go in. If, it's, if you're rinsing it out on a daily basis, then you'll be fine. So it doesn't have to be that elaborate, simple. Uh, housing is, a, let's see if I can show you this little bird house I have here. This is a little, Ran or chickadee birdhouse. So many birds are cavity nesters, and that means they use holes in the trees. Now, we, you know, obviously we don't want uh, trees falling on our house and harming our house. So uh, we cut down those dead trees, and uh, understandably. And, but we, those dead trees are very, very important to our wildlife. And housing is at a shortage, not only for people in New Jersey, but for birds too. So by putting up birdhouses for things like, uh, things like uh, chickadees and house wrens and nuthatches and woodpeckers are, are very important to um, providing a place for them to live. And, and, uh, and so a good, some tips on a good, birdhouse would be now this is a little wren chickadee house a little about an inch and an eighth hole but what's important is it has ventilation it has drainage holes at the bottom and it's a place to open and clean it that you can see that it's a little place to open and clean the house and it's made out of, this is made out of cedar but there's a lot of different materials they're made out of so a good functional house Cavity nesters could be things like flickers and, and uh, screech owls and, and, and nut hatches and all those cavity nesting birds. So put up some birdhouses and leave them up all year. Birds use them to warm themselves on a cold winter's night and they could huddle in them. So, so in place of those dead trees, put up some, some nice birdhouses in all different places of, of the yard. And the little chickadees, well, uh, the house wrens build false nests and they fill them up all the sticks and the female comes back and she decides which one she likes and she picks out the nice little house. So you may get a lot of houses full of sticks, but chickadees don't use the other ones. Uh, and so these, these don't mind to hang, or chickadee or wren houses can hang, you don't mind if they're swinging. When you get into things like the woodpeckers and screech owls and some of those birds, uh, tit mice, they want the house stationary on the, on, right on the side of a tree. So use the right house to the right um, habitat that you're in. If you put up a bluebird house in the average backyard, you're not going to get bluebirds. That's not the way it works. You have to match it with the right habitat. But putting some nest boxes up is really a nice way to really help the birds for nesting, uh, nesting season. I got to tell you that we put nest boxes up in places like Teaneck Creek, where there's plenty of dead trees, and just about every one of those nest boxes gets used because it's just housing is at a premium. It's a tough thing for birds to do to find a good place to nest. So that's a great way to help. Uh, providing cover could be things like creating a brush pile, is just throwing sticks on top of one another and making a nice place for birds to hide. Uh, cover could be your evergreen tree. Co cover could just be all your, your native plants. Um, and so by creating a little bit of proven, even if it's a corner yard, by pro providing a little bit of those four basic elements, you'll be greatly helping wildlife. Let me talk a little about uh, not only birds, uh, butterflies too, because it's gardening season. We all love butterflies. Never met anybody who didn't like a butterfly, right? So we'll talk about monarchs. Monarch butterfly populations are down probably 90%. It's being considered added to the endangered species, let's believe it or not. A lot of different reasons. One is there is not enough of this milkweed. That's it. No milkweed, no monarch butterflies. No, there's no, they can't give them a bowl of cereal, can't give them a bowl of milk outside. They have to have milkweed. Monarch butterflies lay their eggs on the milkweed, the caterpillar, the eggs hatch, the caterpillars eat 
milkweed, they form a chrysalis and change it to the butterfly. And so they love big open areas and we cut down all the milkweed and we cut down all the other native plants. So butterfly populations have really taken it on the chin, uh, just like birds. And so, but you could create a, a, butter, a butterfly garden, even just a butterfly garden in your yard. And, and it would greatly help those local butterflies. And the, the monarch is migratory, so plant milkweed. Now, many of our native wildflowers have the name weed on them, so don't panic, don't get scared. And sometimes in the nurseries, they rename them because they think you're too afraid to buy something called milkweed or ironweed or joe pie weed. But learn the natives, they're, they're really great. And this is a beautiful wildflower, pink flowers, white flowers, depending on which variety you get. And you know, don't be afraid. Again, thinking differently, right? So it used to be where the old fashioned way of gardening, you would go outside and there'd be a couple of holes in the leaves of a plant and you panic, right? You'd go to the nursery or garden center and ask for some nuclear weapon to kill everything in the yard. But, but what I want you, by thinking differently, when you see those holes in the leaves, something is right, something's going right because when everything is in balance, everything will take care of one another. Insects here, believe me, the birds are gonna eat them. I'll tell you a story, always, I, I spent summers sometimes crushing milkweed aphids. I get orange hands all summer crushing milkweed aphids until last year, I just happened to be sitting down in a chair on one of our butterfly projects and I watched a goldfinch coming in and out and in and out of the milkweed. I said, what is that little goldfinch eating? That, there's no seeds there yet, it's early in the year. Well, I watched him close, he was scooping up mouthfuls of aphids and bringing them back to the nest. So, um, you know, so again, when all things are balanced, everything depends on one another. This, this is another cool plant, see that? So everybody know what our state butterfly is? It's the black swallowtail. And this is the host plant for the black swallowtail. That's the called golden zizia. And that's a wild flower too. Now it looks very much like parsley, right? Because it's in that family of parsley and dill. But this is a beautiful wild flower that black swallowtail. And so, on. so our butterflies are very, very specific on what plants they'll use as their host plants. Some have multiples, but so when you're doing a butterfly garden, you plant host plants, things that the butterflies lay their eggs on, and, and things that they nectar on. Some do uh, double duty. You'll see uh, lots of butterflies nectaring on milkweed. And even the, uh, I was watching uh, Zizia this morning out in one of our projects and watching the bumblebees and their pollen sacs were big and yellow and filled with pollen from the zizia. So, so again, this, you know, you could have a butterfly garden and birds can't read the signs and they'll use the butterfly garden and the same butterflies will go and use uh, your bird garden because they can't read what the same for signs as butterfly bird or butterfly garden. So when you improve habitat, you know, for everyone, uh, you improve it, or for one species, you improve it for every species. You know, I, years ago when Bergen Audubon first got into restoring butterfly habitat, some of our members and even some of our board members would say, uh, you know, what, why is, uh, what's Audubon got to do with butterflies? I don't understand it. Well, you know, it's all about the habitat. It's all about the habitat. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. And, and you know, you, you can do this too. So, um, you know, and, and I'll give you another example. One of my favorite native plants is, is spice bush. Spice bush is really the, if there's an example of a perfect native plant, it's, it's spice bush, right? So spice bush gets little yellow flowers, much like forsythia does in the spring. And forsythia isn't good any, for any much of anything. Don't plant uh, spice bush. Now spice bush also gets on the female plant, big fat red berries. This is the wonderful thing about native plants. Everything is timed perfectly. Our wildlife has evolved for eons, for, for, forever, for millions of years with these native plants. So they get their seeds, their berries, their food, whatever it is, at exactly the right time that our wildlife needs them. And spice bush will get a big fat red berry in time for fall migration that's full of fat, but also, it's the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail butterfly. So they lay their eggs on it, caterpillars eat it. So it's, it's, it's perfect. And you want to make tea out of it, it's good for us too. So, so that is just you know, one of the, again, a perfect plant that you could use in your backyard that's readily available at uh, many of the nurseries. So um, you know, create different levels of the canopy, improve 
what you have. If you have big open areas, create butterfly gardens and meadows. If you have uh, lots of big trees and shaded, you create a shade garden, you create a meadow uh, garden uh, or woodland garden. I'm sorry, woodland garden with, under those trees, just like you would if you walked out to a wooded area like the celery farm or, or something like that. You kind of recreate that habitat and it'll be like turning on a light in a dark room. Believe me, you know, it'll be like, you know, from all the habitats that Bergen Audubon helped restore to even my, my little backyard here. Uh, I live in an industrial part of uh, the Meadowlands, tiny little backyard. I have about 60 different species of birds, hummingbirds every year. So when somebody up in the northern part of the county tells me, oh, you never get hummingbirds, I got to laugh because you can get hummingbirds where, wherever you are. Um, and I just was watching two this morning over at our Overpeck uh, Garden Project. So again, this, this is really something empowering, something that we all can do. And again, we, we can have that instantaneous, what else can we do in the environment that, you know, sometimes we feel powerless, right? But this is something that we could do and have the immediate positive effect on, on the environment. Uh, put in a spice bush, you just helped a lot of different species. Put in a milkweed, you just helped a lot of different species of butterflies and pollinators. There's nothing else that, that can do that, you know? So, um, and, and let me, listen. we do have a certification program and this is a freebie. So if you just meet the criteria and that could be a native plant, it's really based on a diversity of native plants. Uh, you really don't have to have anything else for us to start. That's what we're really looking for. I mean, we'd like to know if they have birdhouses and, and other things, but that really the diversity of native plants. So we'll give you this lovely sign and a certificate. And it's all for free. It's all for free. We're not, we don't charge for any of it. We have close to 150 uh, yards, school yards, church yards, everything certified now. And we're creating, we map it out and we're creating those stepping stones in between all those nature centers. And, and we have a map uh, online where we have those all spotted out. And that's what we're really doing is, is connecting those places. So it's really working now. So it's a great program and, and um, you know, feel free to do it. Uh, a couple books I'll recommend for you. Uh, if you really want to get a more really great idea of what's going on, get Bringing Nature Home by, by uh, Douglas Ptolemy. And he has another uh, new book that just came out too. So, you know, Douglas Ptolemy is an uh, um, entomologist from the University of Delaware who really put all our crazy thinking into facts. I felt, you know, we all felt so justified when he actually counted the number of insects and what insects uh, and what birds use what insects on, on uh, native plants. And so this somehow was justified in... Uh, and thinking the way we were. But that's really a great book, you really get an idea. If you wanna learn about what native plants are good for your area, Native Plants of the Northeast by Donna Leopold. Great, great book, that's a Bible for really learning about the native plants of the Northeast. And I don't know if you could find uh, this book still, it's an old one, Butterflies of New Jersey. Uh, and you know, butterfly, um, what butterflies use are very localized, very regionalized. So what a butterfly likes in North Jersey may not work in South Jersey. And this book was really, really good. Like not, not a fun read, but definitely a great reference book. And I don't know if it's still in print or not, but if you can find that, it's really a really nice one. Do I have any questions yet or? Hi, yeah, we have some <laughs> My sound is a little off there. Uh, we have some questions that came in through the chat, so I'll ask you them and then we'll open it up to the room too. So, um, and also at the end of the program, um, maybe I, I'll email a list of the plants that you mentioned so that they have the correct spellings. Okay. Um, so the first question is, uh, someone wanted to know, how do you hang the bird houses so squirrels or chipmunks don't take it over from a tree branch? <laughs> well, you could um, put a baffle, if you're hanging it, you could put a baffle above it. That's a big kind of dome, so you hang it under that baffle and that'll stop the squirrels from coming down. Um, but you know, if it's a, ba it's a uh, birdhouse on a pole, then you could put a baffle on the pole, keep the pole 10 feet away from anywhere the squirrels can leap horizontally, the chipmunks won't get up. But sometimes, 
sometimes you just kind of take chances, you know, it's just the way it is in nature. You know, you try to put it in, and you want to put your birdhouses away. If you have any bird feeders, put them away from the bird feeders because they don't want to nest close to other bird activity, other birds are nesterators. So they want to be secretive when they breed. So if you have a bird feeder in the backyard, maybe a birdhouse in the front yard or the side yard. Um, but squirrels can, can be a problem for them, but um, putting predator guards on the holes, metal guards so the squirrels can't shoot the holes bigger is good. Um, and you can only do so much, you know, you can only, there's, there's no guarantees, no guarantees in nature at all, but sometimes a above baffle will work. Yeah. I, I saw somewhere online that someone hung a slinky on a, a pole of a bird feeder. That I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't know if that works. I've, I've seen it too, but there are baffles I know that work, which are like big cones or big tube stovepipe ones that, but they only work as good as where you put them. You know, the squirrel could leap eight to 10 feet horizontally. So basically the pole would have to be out in the middle of the yard with the baffle on it in order for squirrels. And if you put it too close to a tree or a fence, you'll kind of waste your money for it, you know? <laughs> okay, uh, so the next question we had was, can the butterfly plants be planted in clay containers? But you could, uh, yes, yes, you could, you could definitely start a butterfly garden in containers. Absolutely. Now, I, I, if you want them to overwinter, now they should be big. You know, that's, that's the thing. You don't want to put it in a tiny container, but, you know, in a good size container, maybe 12 inches, 18 across and a little deep, they'll overwinter in those containers. They're pretty hardy. So I have out in my yard right now, I have milkweed that's coming back that was in the last year the zizia grows great in a container so you could have a patio garden and and for, for butterflies definitely most most of those native plants are survive in those containers yeah um, for some of the native plants that you mentioned um, are, do they do better in sun or shade or well it, the, the ones that I well a spice bush will be good in sun or shade you know that does well milk when you get into more of the uh, butterfly plants, more of them, as you you ha they should be out in the sun. There are butterflies that are are, are shaded, and you can create again if you're going to do uh, if you got shade, create a woodland garden. Look at the plants that would grow uh, on those good things like clethora, maybe or uh, so many different plants that grow in that lower. Can and you try to you try to create a perfect habitat. There's something called stratification when you're, uh, whether you're birding or creating habitat. So some birds, right now there's warblers out there and sometimes warblers are at, you know, 80 feet on the top of the tree. Some of the warbler species and you get warbler neck and you go to your chiropractor. So other birds will use the ground like the thrushes. So when you create those uh, different levels of the canopy, upper canopy, the lower canopy trees, shrubs into the meadows, that's the more bird species you're gonna get. But, don't be discouraged because you have a lot of shade from creating a wildlife garden. Just create, make a, make a, uh, a, a garden for, um, uh, you know, for, for a forest, forest garden. Yeah. Uh, here's a, an, an important question that a lot of people have. I'm sorry, my sound is acting up a little. Um, do deer eat these plants? <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, uh, again, you know, again, we do restoration projects that, Overpeck at Teaneck Creek up at New Jersey Botanical Garden. And I can tell you, at Teaneck Creek, there's deer as big as moose. <laughs> they look like they made the cover of Film Stream magazine. But we learned to deal with them pretty well. We, had, we don't have anything fenced off. Now, sometimes if a plant is small, you know, we cage it up until it gets a little bigger and healthier. So, the, and look, you've got problems with rabbits. I think sometimes the rabbits are worse than the deer because they blame the deer for everything. Uh, and groundhogs, but, and what I find too is that deer like something new. And so if we put plants in that, that you know, they don't like, but there's a new one in there, they'll come and taste the new one. So I, I would say plant big, you know, uh, deer will browse some of these things, but normally don't chew them to the ground. But plant, you know, instead of planting a little uh, a shrub that big, as opposed to full cost more money, but in the long run, you'd be better off. But things like button bush, which is our native butterfly bush. So butterfly bush is non-native. I know everybody likes to plant it, 
but it's not that healthy for the butterflies. So plant button bush. Button bush, the deer, once it's big, the deer leave it alone. It attracts as many uh, butterflies as, as a butterfly bush does. And it's a great native plant and really fits into the ecosystem much better. So most of these plants, are, again, will be browsed by deer, but you, you, could, you could deal with them. Don't be afraid if they nibble on it and go about their business. And if they chew it down, it's going to grow back. So yeah, so <laughs> you could do it. Um, what plants attract hummingbirds? Oh boy, I was watching two hummingbirds this morning and I love our native honeysuckle. It's great. Now, don't buy the non-native because it's invasive. It'll grow everywhere and you'll yell at me. So I'm not telling you to plant that plant. Our Lonicera sempervirens is our native. Our bee balm, Monata, is a magnet for the hummingbirds. And, and cardinal flower. Cardinal flower, you know, cardinal flower, the only thing that could pollinate cardinal flower is a hummingbird. So if you plant one or all three of those, I will guarantee you, you will have hummingbirds. If you don't have them, you're not looking. Look early in the morning, look towards evening. I don't care where you are, you can create, uh, you could get uh, hummingbirds. I, and I, I want to remind everyone because I can't spell most of the flowers and plants that you're mentioning that John's going to give me a list of the plants that he's mentioning and we will because that question keeps coming up. What, what did you say? What was that plant? So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll send out a list at the end to everybody. Um, uh, let's see. And someone asked, uh, oh, what other names does milkweed go by? Uh, well, there's butterfly weed, which is uh, uh, Asclepius tuberosa, but otherwise either there's swamp milkweed, there's common milkweed, there's purple milkweed. Uh, in New Jersey, there's probably nine or so species of milkweed, but at the nurseries, you're going to run into three of them. Swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, or, or the common milkweed. Out of those three, I would plant a swamp milkweed. Uh, which they tend to, now common milkweed is great, but it's going to start running all over the place. So if you become aggressive, it may not be something you want in your backyard. Swamp milkweed is very tame. Butterfly weed is nice too, but I think if you put them right next to each other, you'll find more uh, caterpillars on, on the swamp. Butterfly weed is more for drier, sandier soil. Swamp milkweed doesn't have to grow in a swamp. Average garden soil, you'll be fine. Okay. <laughs> Um, someone asked, is smartweed good for any birds, butterflies? Smartweed, yeah. Smartweed is good for birds. Yeah, the, the, a lot of sparrow species love that. And you'll even see butterflies nectar on them. There are native and non-native species of smartweed. Sometimes it's hard to tell, but yeah, I've seen everything from white-throated sparrows using the little, uh, little berries, if you want to call them, little seeds on the smartweed. So yeah, they're good. Okay. Um, I read that bird feeders track rats. Is that true or an urban legend? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, uh, with anything else, you have to clean up, right? So if you were to take uh, bird seed and just let it build up on the ground or throw it on the ground, you're probably gonna attract something. And if there's rats in your area, you probably get them. Uh, but no, use a good quality bird seed. Don't use any filler seed because that just sits on the ground. And eventually you have to rake up you know, if you think you're going to get rats, use something with no shells. It's very clean. The birds eat it all, so there's nothing builds up. But you have to rake up and clean up uh, every once in a while. You don't want any stuff to build up. And 99% of the time, you, you, you'll be all right. So it doesn't automatically do it. But if you do bird feed right, you should be fine. Um, okay. Uh, I've seen a bush called a butterfly bush. Is that a different bush or is it another name for the spice bush you mentioned? That, that's a different one. So the butterfly bush is a non-native that comes out of uh, China uh, and it's very popular, but, and it does attract butterflies. It definitely does. But scientists now equate it with, uh, in comparison, it would be like a kid drinking uh, Coca-Cola all day where the nutritional value, it's there, it tastes good to the butterfly, but it's the nutritional value isn't what it should be to the butterflies. And it can become invasive in some areas, although uh, I don't see that invasive here. But I, I always recommend planting the native, so plant buttonbush. Buttonbush is more readily available, and the butterflies love it. I love to have one in my yard, uh, and, and it can grow anywhere. It can grow in the water, it can grow in dry soil, it's, it's just a great, great plant that's big white puff balls or white flowers. So 
Uh, put that instead. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a few more questions. Uh, we just moved into a new house. Do you have an app or website that you recommend for identifying plants and flowers already in our backyard? Yeah, you know what I would use is iNaturalist is an app, is a great app. So you just snap a picture of it and it's pretty darn accurate. It's really, and it'll give you a few to choose from, but iNaturalist, you just download that. I use that a lot when I'm in the field and it works pretty good. Uh, and I want to tag along with that. iNaturalist has an app for kids now called Seek, S-E-E-K. So it's a little, it's not as complicated as iNaturalist. So it's easier for kids to use and they earn badges when they spot something. So, and it's connected to iNaturalist too. Um, and oh, I, I want a badge. Can I get a yeah, badge? <laughs> you can get a badge too. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, I have hard clay type soil. How do I make it better? <laughs> I don't know if that's something you can answer. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, or if anybody's been to our Overpeck uh, Butterfly Project, you know, uh, that's in hard clay cap soil. And we started that probably 10 years ago. And look, if anybody told me now, you know, make a garden here, I would have thought you were crazy. You know, I was like, what am I doing? But we did it. And believe it or not, just plants that like clay soil and we, that ground was so hard that we had to, we had to till it with a pick. We had, and it's really incredible. So you know what? You could throw some compost into it and break it up. But, uh, you know, and eventually when those plants start to grow, they will loosen up that soil. They will bring in the insects and the roots will. Uh, and now the soil in, in, at uh, Overpeck is very different than it used to be because of the plants growing there. So. I wouldn't let that discourage it, you know, break it up a little bit, throw in a few bags of compost if you if you want. Um, you don't even have to, we know there's plenty of places that we planted stuff without compost in it, but that'll certainly give you a head start and help but break those clumps up, put some compost in and plant away. Okay, uh, and again, uh, just a few more. Any bird friendly driveways out there? <laughs> I don't know what that means, sorry. <laughs> Bird, you mean somewhere where you can drive and look at the birds? Is that? Uh, I guess, Debbie, are you out there? If <laughs> you want to no. unmute yourself. <laughs> I'm not too sure what you meant. It was, uh, let's see if I can find Debbie, if she's still in the room. Maybe, maybe she meant like along the driveway, like planting along your driveway. I, I don't see her in the room anymore. Oh, Debbie, there's Debbie. Debbie, I see you. Um, what did you mean by driveway? or she's being shy. Okay, we'll get to the next question. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you have any recommendations for discouraging milkweed beetles? Uh, you know, I, I kind of don't discourage them. I, I um, kind of let it, yeah, I mean, some of them, they'll, they'll eat the seeds. That's what they do with the milkweed beetles, that they'll eat the, uh, and the seed pods won't be vital. Um, but, uh, you know, if I have, uh, if you really wanted to get rid of them, you could just flick them, you know, get a pot of uh, soapy water and just, you know, beetles faint when, they, when they're scared. So you flick it and all flow into the soapy water if you want to get rid of them. But, you know, I don't, I don't bother with them much. I kind of watch them, you know, uh, they're kind of cool. So uh, unless they're really, really devastating the plants or hurting the plants, I, I would not, I tend not to want to, uh, Unless it's an invasive non-native species, and there are some out there, I tend to just kind of let them be. You know? Great. Well, uh, I mean, uh, that's all the questions that were in the chat. I don't know if anyone else had anything to say, um, but I also, again, just wanted to repeat myself. Please go, if you're on Facebook, please follow the Bergen County Audubon Society and just see all the wonderful wonderful things that Don and the organization does for all the parks um, and forests and uh, conservancy areas that they do. They're working on a lot of butterfly gardens right now. And um, I have to say they're like, if you're new to birding and you're new to um, butterflies and pollinators, I, I have just learned so much from Don within the past year. And once we can start doing our Bergen County Audubon walks, I, I mean, that is one way to learn about the plants and the birds and everything. Don is just wonderful as a teacher. Thank you.
Thank you. And anybody has questions, you're welcome to email me and I'll answer them as best I can for you, give you a hand. Uh, okay, and here, uh, one more question just snuck in. I, I guess someone, uh, I'll just back the questions back to back real quick. Someone was uh, interested in, as, this is important too because our bee population is going yes. down as well. So how do we take care of the bees? And also someone wanted to know, they only have a small deck um, in their apartment. I have a condo, so I have that problem too. Uh, rather than a house. So how can you use those small spaces to attract uh, the pollinators? Oh, then put thing, if you can plant things in containers, it would de definitely help. You could put a milkweed in container. You could put any uh, uh, great uh, native flowers into those containers. So don't, don't let that discourage you. And when I talk about, you know, again, our pollinators, uh, when you create a butterfly garden, the pollinators are just really, and butterflies are and pollinators too, and so are birds at, at some point. But our bees, yeah, uh, definitely our bumblebees. We actually have a bumblebee on the endangered species list now. Um, so they're very important. You know, we have, uh, we like to talk about honeybees and honeybees are basically a domestic animal. Honeybees are like chickens and they're an important part of our, our food source. But so of our native bees and there's many, many species of our native bees that we don't think about. Uh, many species of bumblebees and solitary bees, and you know, our, our many of our tomato plants are, are pollinated by our, our native bees. Um, so, um, so again, you create that habitat. Don't use pesticides or insecticides. Put out those native plants that are for pollinators and and and, uh, and butterflies. And and here's the thing I I'll, I'll leave you with something I want you to think about is don't clean up your yard. I'll wait to hear the faint uh, bodies hitting the floor, but <laughs> don't clean up your yard because when you rake up those old leaves, you cut down the plants, you're thrown out next year's pollinators, you're thrown out next year's butterflies. So many species of moths and butterflies and kind of overwinter in the leaf litter, overwinter in the in those little in the in the hollow stems of the plants. So when you clean up, when you're meticulous. You're really, really hurting the, the ecosystem. Those birds, like we talk about the thrushes, the wood thrushes and, and uh, hermit thrushes, any of those birds, watch them, they're in the leaves. They're scratching through those leaves looking for insects, right? Very important. If you waked up all those leaves and you threw everything away, there's no food source there. So people wonder why I don't have things like Luna moths anymore. Where are all my lightning bugs? You threw them out. You threw them out. So don't clean up. I realize there's some areas that want to clean up, but in those garden areas, clean up. But so be a sloppy, messy gardener. It's much healthier for the wild. <laughs> and someone <laughs> wanted to know where do you keep that litter? <laughs> well, right on the ground because it adds fertilizer to it. It builds up the soil, right? Now, again, you you don't you don't want to get you know probably at least three feet tall. I I understand that, but. Your base of garden, you know, have a little, usually in the spring, you have a little layer of leaves in there and you have the stems, let things start to grow. Leave, leave it be. You don't want to, again, leave the leaves. We could do a whole program on just leave the leaves and why that's so important. Uh, okay. I'm just uh, in the chat, I'm sharing the links to the Bergen County Audubon dot org um, website um, where you can get more information and some of the references that Don mentioned today. Sorry, my computer is misbehaving. Um, and also, uh, like I said before, they support so much in the community. I really encourage you to also support the Bergen County Audubon Society. I'm sure Don's looking for new members. <laughs> yes, well all, well, all volunteer organizations, so none of, none of membership goes to uh, any, uh, you know, have very little overhead. You know, it all goes back into conservation and education. And, uh, and, and even though we're called Bergen County Audubon Society, our jurisdiction, we're the local chapter of National Audubon, so our jurisdiction now goes into most of Hudson County and most of Passaic County. So really we're in Northern New Jersey Audubon, but you know, we've been around for like 78 years, 79 years, so it's too late to change our name now. So, so uh, but you could be a member wherever you are. Yeah. And I guess, uh, I, I think, I, do you have time for one more question? One more, yep. Okay, one more question. Um, someone wanted to know, oh, those, those darn squirrels, how does a 
squirrel baffle distract the squirrel from going into a birdhouse? Wouldn't they just go to both places? Now, a baffle is something that uh, it, it stops either something from climbing up the pole or something from coming down. So uh, that's just a deterrent. That's what a baffle is. This is a deterrent that stops, it just makes it unable to climb, go around it, whether it's a top or bottom. All right, and um, I, uh, I'm sorry, I swear it's the last one and then we'll wrap it up. And of course, if you have further questions, you know, follow Donna, uh, the Audubon Society on Facebook, and I'm sure you'll follow up with some questions there too. Um, but this is interesting, and I, I have to kind of agree with this question that someone's asking. And I think, you know, with parks being closed recently, I have seen an increase in wildlife and someone said they've noticed more things like robins cardinals and blue jays um and yeah. i'm finding lots of fun warblers that i've never seen in my complex before yes yeah, so well i'm right after this i'm running down to the meadowlands to do an interview with the record about that subject exactly so um i, I don't think there's more birds they're spread out more. i think we're disturbing them a lot less but we're seeing them a lot more number one because we're paying attention and then we're not out there, you know, wildlife has got a nice vacation from us and they're enjoying it. <laughs> and, you know, so we're not out disturbing them, not driving cars, we're not, you know, doing crazy stuff. We're not interfering with them in the parks, you know, we're just being nicer to them and they are come out a little more and we're seeing them more. And they're probably in places that they would avoid in the past. Uh, some of our grass, gra more grassy, even our backyards, our neighborhoods, that maybe there was just a lot of too many disturbances for a lot of different reasons. Our disturbances aren't there, and now they're nesting in places that they didn't do before. So, um, you know, it's just great. I mean, if anything comes out of this, I really hope that people, uh, you know, pay more attention to nature and that we realize how important nature is to us and that we never forget that. Hopefully this, this will all be over soon, but um, we shouldn't forget how uh, much uh, nature means to all of us. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Don. And um, thank you to everyone that joined us today. Uh, we had a, an amazing crowd um, and I saw our director, Nancy Green, came and joined us as well. Thank you, Nancy, for coming. And, you know, just thank you. For everyone, and you know, we all miss you at the library, um, and we can't wait to see you soon. And if you have further questions for Don, feel free to email me at k, the letter k, Wallace, W A L L A C E, at ridgewoodlibrary.org, and I can forward them to Don. Um, and I will be following up with the recording, as well as a survey and a list of the plants that Don mentioned and the books. So, um, just a huge thank you to everyone. Uh, and thank you, Don, so much. And thank, thank you, you for everything you do. Thank you. It was fun. Uh, great. All right. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs> okay. Thank, Bye -bye. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.